Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. Today, we are thrilled to welcome one of my favorite performers, a star of stage and screen and television, star of a couple of great Disney musicals, host of multiple television shows, including Hollywood Squares, guest host of The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, an incredible 87 times, and the owner and star of his own venue, Club Sandwich, located in Center Sandwich, New Hampshire. Please help us welcome John Davidson. John, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hi, Ike. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, great to be on Pop Culture Retro. Yeah, I am retro. That, that's what I am. <laughs> <laughs> so are we, hence the name of our show. Yeah. <laughs> but we've been looking forward to having you on for a long time. I mean, but you're one of those guests who, who you're like, where do we start? Your career has been so varied and extensive in all areas. So I guess we'll start at the beginning. Um, you grew up in Pittsburgh to a religious family. Your parents were ministers. Did you always want to be a performer? And how did that conversation go when you said, hey, this is what I want to do? No, I was a very shy kid. And, uh, but growing up uh, as a preacher's kid, you're, you're exposed to a lot of people. So you learn to, to, uh, oh, to schmooze with anybody who comes into the house or whatever. So you, I got used to uh, putting on that face of being the, uh, the uh, perfect person uh, preacher son thing and I, I'm really not not religious at all I, I, mm -hmm. I'm an atheist that, but my I come from a very religious family and and I I, I became a philosophy major at Denison University oh. uh, uh, and graduated with a BA in theater arts because I went into theater arts originally so I could be a better preacher and, and then I realized I really don't have I don't I don't have the religion I, I just uh, I'm uh, I, I just uh, I, 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 I just can't buy it. And uh, so I've had, uh, my, and my folks were very supportive of that. And, That's good. Yeah, but growing up as a preacher's kid, it's a, very, uh, it's a very theatrical way to grow up because you're constantly put on parade as being the epitome of what a fine young man should be. You know. <laughs> well, what's the first thing you remember um, performing in? Oh, uh, well, at Denison, uh, I did a musical my, at the end of my sophomore year, and that's when I changed from my philosophy major to a theater arts major, because I, 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 I like theater arts people. I, I like, uh, I, and the study of theater, of course, is the study of human nature, and, and uh, I like trying to figure out why we do what we do and, and, and uh, what makes the whole thing work. So, uh, my first show was a, a musical called Down in the Valley. Mm -hmm. And then I, and then I did some Shakespeare in, in, in college. And, uh, oh, I played little Abner and, uh, uh, in little Abner. Uh, I did, uh, I did the Fantastics there for the first time, the uh, off-Broadway musical that I later did on Hallmark right. Hall of Fame. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I did a lot of theater and, and, uh, and then went to New York City and got started on Broadway in 63, I guess, yeah. Oh, so, I mean, that's really what, how, how you got discovered was getting into Broadway. Yeah, in the 60s, there was a question when you're a theater arts major, should you, if you want to be in, in theater and, and television, should you go to New York or L.A.? Well, L.A. was that's where all the TV was. And back then that's where the film was, but I wanted to go to Broadway. And, and my first show was, uh, was uh, playing Curly in a, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. So I played Curly and, and uh, won, got an award for it, uh, for a newcomer to Broadway. And, uh, that got me going and and then a television producer saw me uh in this show called foxy well it was uh, oklahoma 
and then Foxy with Bert Lahr. I, I played uh, uh, well, uh, uh, the young juvenile lead in that, a uh, romantic lead. And, and then this TV producer, Bob Banner, who discovered Carol Burnett on Broadway, was looking for a guy to develop as a variety show host. And so he, he developed me and I signed a contract with him uh, to, and he got me a co Columbia Records contract, uh, yeah. recording contract. And so Bob Banner really got me going as a, as a, as a total career, not, not just in Broadway. His idea was that uh, be a Swiss army knife, uh, 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 be, a, be a pitchfork mm. uh, as opposed to just a spear. Mm. And he said, you got to do it all. And so he helped me do a Las Vegas act. And, uh, and uh, so he, he fashioned kind of a, a broad career, uh, jack of all trades, perhaps master of none. I mean, I, 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 sure. never, I never spent enough time recording in, in the recording studio. So I have no, I have no identity. I, I put out some records that, that got some play, but I never had a big, big record. So when people come to see me, when I'm singing as John Davidson, uh, I can do anything I want. It's, it's very free, but they have no idea what I'm going to do musically. So that's a lot mm. of freedom. You, know? mm. you, you just mentioned that the Fantastics, that you were in the, the TV special, the Fantastics, who also had uh, Ricardo Montalban on there. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that came about, how you got cast, and then what that experience was like all of a sudden, you know, working on this television program? Yeah, that was one of my first TV shows. Uh, the Entertainers was the other one in uh, 64, I guess. At, uh, yeah, 64. Um, I, uh, and that was the Entertainers was with Carol Burnett and Bob Newhart and uh, Dom DeLuise and uh, just some great people. Mm. Uh, but the Fantastics, I played Matt. Uh, that's the, the juvenile lead. And, and Susan Watson was the young girl in that. I, I later, I, she was also in Oklahoma with me, Oklahoma with me in the Broadway revival. But um, yeah, uh, uh, fantastic, of course. Try to remember the time of September when grass was green and rain was yellow. Try to remember the kind of September when you were a tender and callow fellow. Well, I certainly was a callow fellow. And I, <laughs> I, I admired uh, Ricardo Montalban saying that in the show as El Gallo. And uh, mm. of course, I think that's probably the most well-known song from the Fantastics. And uh, Ricardo Montalban was so cool. I, I, uh, I just wanted to be like Ricardo Montalban, you know. <laughs> But anyway, I was I was very square and very wholesome and very clean. I remember being very clean cut, and uh, because of the conservative family that I came from, you know, and uh, so I I uh, and then I began to meet theater people, and of course they uh, broadened my, <laughs> broadened my outlook on life. Uh, uh, that yeah, I I've. Uh, I, when, when Bob Banner helped me put together my Las Vegas show, that mm -hmm. I played the, El the Elvis showroom at the Hilton, we always had a guitar segment where I would sing with my guitar. And uh, that was my favorite segment in the show. So now, I mean, uh, let's skip ahead here. I, I just turned 80, 80, oh. 80. <laughs> I just turned 80 last December. Uh, I asked uh, somebody, I said, do, do you think I look like 80? And, and she said, no, you used to, but not anymore. <laughs> oh, that's a great line. <laughs> <laughs> so, but now at 80, I love, I have a little club in, in Sandwich, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And it's called, of course, Club Sandwich, which is kind of a corny name, but uh, I it's present fantastic. other performers. One night a week, I, I present other uh, singing uh, singer-songwriters, and then I sing every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday matinees. And uh, so I, I'm putting lots of new songs in for this, this season. We opened June the 24th. I wrote a new song. Spend one night with an old guy, and you never go back. <laughs> 
to the boys. Spend one night with an old guy. Let the little boys go play with their toys. I'm talking about a guy who can slow down. Turn your hot flashes into chills. <laughs> you might need a break from his passion. You might need to hide his little pills. <laughs> Don't you worry about your reputation. Oh, he'll never tell how you drove him insane. No. He won't, cause he can't remember the things that you did. No, he won't remember your name. <laughs> Spend one night with an old guy, and you never go back to the boy. Just one more verse. You'll play Johnny Mathis on his eight track. His lava lamp will glow all through the night. He'll whisper, you're the prettiest girl in the world. Of course, he's probably losing his sight. But who cares if it makes you feel special? Just don't let it go to your head. Cause he's never gonna invite you home to meet his parents. There's a pretty good chance they're dead. <laughs> oh my god. And that one night <laughs> with an old guy. And you never go back to the boys. Big finish. You won't find the guy more grateful. I mean, it's not like they're beating down his door. And next morning, he'll have no job to dash off to. He can kind of stick around and uh, fix that cracked window or, or that squeaky kitchen cabinet door or glue together that wobbly chair. Or anything else around the house that needs a little tender of love and care. You'll have a dandy, randy, handy man. And ooh, you'll never go back to the boys. <laughs> That's my new song. That is fantastic. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we, we were going to ask about Club Sandwich after, but since you brought it up now, when, when you decide to start doing it. I've seen the pictures of the venue. It looks fantastic. It looks like such a fun place to watch a show in. So how did that come about? Well, I, for the last couple of years, I've been touring. Um, I've always done Broadway shows all through my career, but I, I, I was the wizard in Wicked, uh, mm. the Broadway musical Wicked. I played the wizard for three different contracts over a wow. period of about, about a year. And then I played Captain Hook and, uh, another character is actually a dual role in finding Neverland, the story about uh, Peter Pan, how it was written by James Berry. And um, so I've been touring a lot. And I thought, I just want to stay where I, at, at, I, I had moved uh, to New Hampshire to get back to my roots because I grew up in West Bridgewater, Massachusetts, long story. But I wanted to get back to New England, found an old barn, old farmhouse that had been redone uh, and and so moved to Sandwich, New Hampshire, where this great house was. Met a lot of great people here, and uh, and I thought I'm going to take this barn in Center Sandwich and make it into a showroom, and uh, I'm going to sing there, and I'm going to my my opening number is. Well, I bet you're probably wondering what I'm going to do tonight. A fella has to holler when he's feeling all right. I finally busted out. I busted out. I was trapped in your TV. <laughs> now I'm gonna tell you what you're doing. 
in the me. You drive me crazy. You know, so that I'm, and through <laughs> that, I, in that number, I kind of talk about being on Broadway in Vegas mm -hmm. and how I've settled, settled here in Sandwich. And uh, I, I just, I love singing with my guitar. Uh, to me, it's better than sex. Of course, most things are now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I just love singing with my guitar. So, uh, and then I present other performers on Thursday night. If anybody wants to check that, they could go to johndavidson.com and there are tickets available. But my first two shows are sold out, actually. Ju June 24th and 25th are sold out. See, it's it's a very small place. <laughs> <laughs> when I say I'm sold out, there's only like 40 seats and it's like singing in my living room. It's uh, so I love it. Yeah. All right, we're going to post all the information as well, but I really urge everyone to go check out the pictures. It looks so fantastic. It looks like such a fun place to see a show, as I mentioned. It like so so cozy, actually. So uh, we will. I, I did want to go back. I wanted to ask about um, you were a couple of the Disney musicals that you were in, you know, including Let's Start with Happiest Millionaire, which is one of my favorite Disney movies. I've watched it so many times and it starred you, Leslie Ann Warren, Fred McMurray, Tommy Steele, songs by the Sherman Brothers. It was the last film that Disney was involved with. How did you get the role and what was Walt like? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks, Jonathan, for, for remembering that. Yeah, this, I, I, um, uh, the Disney people saw me on a Bell Telephone Hour, a show I did in New York, and I signed actually a three-picture contract. It was my first movies, and um, as you say, the Sherman Brothers had written Mary Poppins, mm -hmm. and uh, they were trying to follow up with another uh, period musical. It took place in uh, 1912, Happ Happiest Millionaire. Uh, the trouble is it didn't have the fantasy that Mary Poppins had. It didn't have any cartoons on the screen, mm -hmm. and... Um, then we didn't have Dick Van Dyke and, and uh, oh, I can't think of the wonderful lady's name who played Mary Poppins. Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I fell in love with Leslie Ann Warren in the film. And, and uh, in uh, Happy Millionaire, I say, are we dancing? Are we really here? Is this feeling something real? Or will it disappear? And... Uh, it was a it was my big break in film and and uh, you knew that Walt Disney was coming down to the set because they, everybody would say Walt is coming, never Mister never Mister Disney Walt is coming, so everybody get kind of nervous and uh, uh, he called me John and, and and at lunchtime you'd see him at the commissary having lunch right there at another table he was very visible. Uh, hi john how you doing oh fine walt <laughs> how you doing walt i mean oh my wow. goodness it was a fantasy to me and and uh, i was 24 something like that just uh no it was in 66 i was 25 so uh, anyway anyway so um yeah it 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 uh it was a thrill, and uh, Fred McMurray, Tommy Steele was in it. What a talent! A, a British, British, uh, British rock and roller who grew up to do uh, Broadway shows, um, and then that led to the one and only genuine originally family band, the second one. Th those are both available in DVD. So a lot of young people know me from these films. In in family band, I had the love duet was about time, about time. We had a little taste of wasting time like lovers do. I'll waste a little time along with you. About time we two were living out a lovely dream come true about you, about me, about my... Um, just looking into Leslie Ann Warren's eyes uh, for the four months that we shot it, I had such a crush on her. And... Mm -hmm. uh, we got along great, and, and uh, so that was fun doing those two films with her. Um, but yeah, that was my introduction into doing films. Well, I, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, no, I was I, just going to ask about, about, about Walt. I, 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 I didn't get to work for the studio until the uh, mid-70s, so I never had the opportunity to meet him. Um, you mentioned he visited the set, but was he very involved in the movie? 
I didn't really know, quite honestly. Uh, of course, each 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 of one of the films, I'm, I'm sure you know, Ike, that uh, each film has its own producer, right? Yeah. So, and our producer was a man named Anderson. Um, can't think of his first name. Um, but yeah, it, it, so he was involved with the. Uh, Walt never, he never made any comments. He never said, oh, you better do that again. That could be better. He never tried to direct. He was very much a, a perfect uh, CEO in that he, he hired great people around him to, to do it right. And uh, mm. I'm, I'm sure in, in those meetings that, that we never saw as, as actors, uh, I'm sure he said now, this is the way we do it here at Disney. And because everybody uh, was very aware of, the, of what it meant to make a Disney film. And of course, The Happiest Millionaire was the last one he made before he died. And mm. then Family Band, I was there for making the first musical when he when Walt wasn't there. Uh, so everybody everybody was <clears throat> running around saying, what would Walt do? What what would Walt do? What would Walt want this to be? And of course, you can't run a studio that way. You've got to, you got to, you know, you can't try to fit into his shoes. You've got to buy your own shoes and wear your own shoes. Um, so, yeah, that was an interesting time to be at Disney. But he was he was just always very supportive and of course he was smoking one cigarette at Walt Disney one cigarette after another just a chain smoker and mm. what what a shame but uh, what a great man I don't know if you know anything about it but I, I read that the Sherman brothers didn't want Fred McMurray in Happiest Millionaire but Walt overruled did you hear anything about that at the time no no not at all. Uh, Fred McMurray was a, just an interest. I, I, he'd be sitting in his chair there waiting to go on. And I, I took some, I took a minute, went over and sat next to him. And I said, yeah, would you, I, cause at that time I was hosting the Carson show. I was, I was sitting in for Johnny Carson a lot. I said, would you ever do the tonight show with me? You know, I'd love to have you as a guest. And he said, Oh, no, John, I, I'm not very comfortable with those kind of shows. He, he really wasn't. He was a very shy man. And, he said, you know, I'm the least likely person to be in this business. He mm. said, I was, I was playing saxophone in a band and somebody said, you know, you could be an actor. And he said, well, might as well try that. And just, he, he was just a very unassuming, uh, uh, humble guy and who, who didn't like to talk about himself. And uh, he probably would have been a terrible guest on the Tonight Show. I'm, I'm glad he said he didn't want to do it. <laughs> but uh, just a great guy. And uh, yeah, okay. Well, you just mentioned uh, Tommy Steele a few minutes ago, and the number you have with him, "Let's Have a Drink," is one of one of my favorites in any Disney film. I love that song. I watched, like I said, I watched that movie so many times. You still hear the song "Walking Down Main Street" in Disney. How much fun was that to film, and you know, and working with Tommy Steele on that? Jonathan, you're great, but you really should get out more. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm sure you have a lot of other favorite things, but thanks, thanks for liking that. It, it was great. It was Tommy Steele's number all the way. Uh, he was just so magnetic and. I wanted to be like Tommy Steele. He just was a powerhouse, magnetic live performer. He then did uh, half a sixpence on Broadway after that. Went to see him and went backstage and we reminisced about, about that song. And a lot of stuntmen, a lot, it was a fight in a bar. And uh, um, well, well, well. Uh, well, well, well. In an Irish pub, uh, just a really fun song. Um, I think the song was perfect for him because he's kind of a song and dance man, and uh, it was great working with him. It it uh, it was full of stunt men. There were just a lot of fists flying, and I learned how to throw a punch. <laughs> I, I think, who did I knock out? I, I knocked out somebody. I don't know. But of course, I didn't really hit him. It was all, <laughs> it's all fake. And, uh, and then I wound up, uh, uh, oh, I, I don't know. I, anyway, 
it, it was fun. The, the whole movie was great. We spent about four months doing it, uh, which I guess is the normal time to make a musical film. And, and uh, it was a pleasure. Just, just curious, because the character you played, the Andre Duke, did not have a happy ending in real life. So did you ever get to meet the real Cordelia Biddle? Biddle? Did she ever come down to watch anything or no? Uh, we met somebody from one of the, yeah, it was about these famous families of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. um, the Dukes and the Biddles. Uh, somebody did come to the set one day. I think it was a Biddle. I, I don't, I, I don't even know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so many people came down to the set uh, uh, that I, I, I I think I did meet people from the family, but I don't remember that much about mm -hmm. it. Well, had you seen the play or read the book that the movie was based on? Uh, no, no. Uh, well, wasn't it, uh, what was it based on? The, it was uh, Cordelia Biddle had written her book about the family. And uh, I think there was a Broadway play in the 50s about that, that Walt got the uh, idea to turn it into a musical after. Yeah. Uh, I probably did in, in getting ready for the part. I, I just can't remember. I, I didn't, you know, it was all so new to me there. And I was just, uh, the whole time is just went by so fast. I was just meeting new things and doing th new things every day. Well, you had mentioned, um, you'd mentioned Leslie Ann Warren. What was, what was it like working with her? Uh, just a great lady, very honest with herself. Uh, she reminded me a little bit of Sally Field. I, I did a series later with Sally Field called The Girl with Something Extra, mm -hmm. where I, she had ESP and could read my mind, and I played her husband. Um, uh, that sort of honesty. I, I, I've never worked with the people like Meryl Streep, but I, I bet working with Meryl Streep was this tremendous honesty and, and self-awareness, and uh, Leslie Ann has that, just feet on the ground, and so does Sally Field, and just... Uh, just uh, no, no pretension. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you could you could just share anything with them. Uh, uh, just uh, we were instant buddies and uh, just very open people that were very honest. I, I think you find that in the, the most successful people. Uh, maybe this isn't true, but I, I've just met met so many great people in show business that that. Uh, that had this honesty about it. You, in order to play a role and to figure out, you have to figure out who you are so you can play another role. And so there's a lot of self-discovery and self, uh, uh, you know, just getting honest with yourself. And, and those are my favorite people in shows, show business, the people that are honest with themselves. And those ladies were. Well, you, you just mentioned, I'm sorry, uh, you just mentioned the, the show. We were going to ask you about that as well. The, the Girl with Something Extra with Sally Field. Uh, also had Terry Garnett about, you know, like you said, a woman who could read, why, your wife who could read minds, which seems like a terrible <laughs> thing in real life. But, right. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks like it, it catered to like the Bewitched and I Dream of Genie audience. And it was right on after Sanford and Son. So it seems like so great. Why do, why do you think that show didn't make it? What, what, what happened with that? Yeah, uh, I ran one year. So we did 26 episodes, but really I think Girl with Something Extra was, uh, uh, of course, Sally was great. And, 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 and uh, she was in transition, you know, as, as you just mentioned from, from being the flying nun and Gidget and those things, she had so much more to offer. And I think she was finding that, uh, in the girl with something extra then and then of course she went on to win all the, the a couple academy academy awards and you know incredible performances but this she was in transition and and the show couldn't decide i think whether it was going to be a romantic comedy or whether it's going to be romantic or be comedy and it wasn't that funny uh it was romantic um but then it tried to be funny and and I, I think it was it was a show that didn't quite find its its way so we had a great first year i think uh again i had a crush on her all the way through the pilot and through making it and and uh i think as the season went on uh we 
we lost that crush and uh, we got along, but it wasn't like when we first started when we were really crazy about each other. So it was an interesting year, but I, uh, we got to know each other really well and, and we could read each other's minds sort of and what, <laughs> how we were gonna react. And she helped me a lot with acting. She's a wonderful uh, actress or actor, however you wanna say it. Uh, and uh, she's just such an inspiration to work with. Great, great lady. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and, and as you mentioned, of course, her career went stratospheric, but a yeah. couple years after that, she just started exploding. Could you, could you see that coming in her? Did you know that was part of, going to be part of her future? Uh, I, I, I thought I could. I, no, no, I had no idea the, of, that she would win awards and stuff, but uh, she was digging deeper and deeper and, and uh, was really uh getting in touch with with deeper things than she ever could show before that in flying down and gidget of course and uh, you could see that she there was had a lot more there that was that she was uh digging into and, and it all worked yeah you, know. hmm. you is around that time the same time the show came out that you did your your cosmopolitan photo shoot where you yeah. were really naked and then you also did the streets of san francisco guest appearance both of which were like so against type for you. Were, that, were those decisions made to try to steer you into another lane? Like your manager said, like, I think you should do this. Yeah, I, I had a manager, uh, Alan Bernard, who, who uh, he's, you know, it, 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 he tried to do things that would broaden my, my, my career and open up other possibilities than just playing boy meets girl and the biggest problem is pimples. And, and so we'd get into things. So, um, he, uh, Helen Gurley Brown was looking for a follow-up to Burt Reynolds in Cosmopolitan. Now, this wasn't naked. I wasn't naked right. in, the, in the Cosmos <laughs> wearing, <laughs> wearing a towel. But um, <laughs> but uh, they made me Mr. February, which, of course, is the, clo the, the shortest month. So I, I thought... Uh, <laughs> now, uh, it's funny, I... I, so I did a centerfold in Cosmo, but um, I don't, I think a lot of people just felt, you know, just, just what are you doing? You know, this, uh, I brought the picture back to Hollywood Squares at the time. I was guesting, Peter Marshall was the host, and I was guesting sitting next to Paul Lynn. So Paul Lynn, Peter Marshall says to Peter, you know, John did a centerfold for Cosmopolitan. And, uh, and Paul made a funny face, got a big laugh. And, and then he said, well, he looks like he should have been the ambassador to underdeveloped countries. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was funny. It was funny. Uh, you know, he didn't make up any of that stuff. All of Paul Lynn's stuff right. on was, was written, you know, but it was a very funny line. But yeah, it was, it was, it, it was kind of a stupid thing to do. And, and, uh, uh, I just uh, so that's why we did the Cosmo centerfold. Um, I still get grandmas now that bring the centerfold up for for me to sign. It's amazing. Uh, so I guess people, I guess women uh, and guys or uh, somebody was buying the magazine. Um, and then the uh, at that same time, this role on the streets of San Francisco, the part part of a female impersonator. Who was a killer? It was a murder mystery. Actually, I I, I kill I kill guys when I was the woman. I, I played a woman and a man, and uh, did kind of a, a Carol Channing impression. Uh, I studied with a female impersonator for for a month or, or at least three weeks, and and uh, it was a it was what I discovered is that when I played the woman. Uh, well, first of all, when we were shooting, I was nervous about doing it. And so I was drinking lots of coffee and, and tab, the diet drink tab. And we were shooting in San Francisco. And uh, so when you're in San Francisco and you're in full drag and you have to go to the bathroom, which bathroom do you go to? <laughs> so I walked in. I walked into the ladies room, figure that would be the quickest in the city. And I wasn't in there for 30 seconds. And a lady walked in and she said, what are you doing in here? 
And I said, how did you recognize me? She said, you were the only one standing. <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. I'm trying to put in jokes. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, but what I discovered is that women, to play a woman, uh, uh, you can, you, women don't talk up here. I mean, o only Julia Child, Julia Child's used to talk well then you take the flower and you put the flower in the thing uh, that, 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 but but a woman just talks up here it's up here it's it, that's all it is and 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 not all men talk down here like uh, uh, you know ricardo Montalban. Uh, but so so the difference vocally between men and women is often you know, it's not that clear. And if you're a drag queen, if you're a drag queen, then you, you well, you do, you, you exaggerate it, you know. And, and also not all women are that feminine, you know. So there was a scene of me walking through the lobby of this hotel, the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco. And uh, I was trying to walk like a woman. And the director said, no, no, you, you look like a drag queen, you, you want to, <laughs> If you want to really be a woman, just, I forget what he told me, but he said, you, you can't overdo it because women don't walk that way. Some women walk like men, some, you know. So I learned a lot about the difference between men and women. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a seven volume book, <laughs> you know, a set of books to do that. <laughs> but yeah, when we got, you, you mentioned the Tonight Show, you know, you were with Johnny Carson, <laughs> Uh, before they asked you to become a guest host, uh, which you did an incredible 87 times, just want to find what was Johnny like a little bit, and how did they come to ask you to be the guest host so many times? Well, it wasn't just be, it, he was very supportive of me. Johnny was just great to me, and I appreciate it. And and Ed and Doc, but uh, there there's always uh, uh, another part of the story. That it started when I was doing the girl with something extra with Sally Field mm -hmm. on a network called NBC. <laughs> so I I think I no one ever said this to me, but I think NBC went to Johnny and Fred DeCorda and Peter LaSalle, the producers, and said, We'd like you to use Davidson as a guest host because he's doing the girl with something extra on NBC. And I swear that's how it started. But then I got along with everybody well and worked. I worked well with Fred DeCordova, who produces the show. And uh, uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 did, I do it uh, a week at a time. I always did Christmas week and usually another week during the show. And um, instead of doing jokes at the top of the, of the show, uh, I sang, sang a couple of songs. And... Uh, it was great. It was a great chance to uh, showcase what I was doing, and and uh, but you you always had to realize that it's Johnny's show, and I would try to get friends on on the show that they would say no, we don't we don't want them. I tried to get Kenny Rogers on the show, oh. and they said no, and they said to me, Kenny Rogers is not a talker, and I said, Are you kidding? Kenny Rogers tells incredibly funny stories and he's a very clever guy. He was, he passed away, of course. But I was able to get Kenny Rogers finally to get him on the show. I think at that point, they just were not booking a lot of country acts. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where that came from, Johnny or whatever. But uh, I finally was able to get Kenny on and he, was, he told a great story. It was very funny. And... Uh, it's it, 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 so so I wasn't I wasn't able to do anything to, but to sit in Johnny's chair and play with a pencil that said Johnny on the pencil and the coffee mug said Johnny on the coffee mug and so it was very much not my seat and uh, I you got, you got to deal with that because because why should it be so uh, but it was a great experience yeah and then after that i got my own talk show i, I replaced mike douglas for westinghouse a daytime talk show for a couple of years and that was great i had a lot to learn about being a host and uh mike douglas pointed that out uh, <laughs> oh dear uh, so that mike douglas wasn't very nice to me about that but i um oh, wow. yeah 
but I, he, he was right in a way. I was an entertainer. I, I flew in from Las Vegas to host my own talk show. And I mean, really, it's uh, I had a lot to learn and I got better in the second year. Well, how, how was your relationship with Johnny? Was that was that good? Oh, excellent. Excellent. Just just a great just a great guy. Very supportive. And Johnny Carson is, is a very was a very shy man. And uh, um. I mean, at a party, you would see him over talking to someone in the corner. He was, he was never the life of the party. You know, he's a very, he was a very shy, um, I, don't, I don't know what creates that, but uh, um, low self-esteem, I, I, I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist, but um, so yeah, I, I don't think that Ed McMahon knew Johnny Carson that well. Hmm. I don't think that Doc Severinsen knew him that well. And, and I, I didn't know him that well either, but he was always so supportive of me and, and uh, just great, just a real gentleman, real gentleman, yeah. Well, you, you'd mentioned something that's interesting that just, you know, you said to you when you were guesting that they didn't let you have uh, certain guests that you wanted. Were there also, did they also not let you have other guests that they said, oh no, no, we're saving them for when Johnny comes back? I didn't get that feeling. No, I, um, no, I, I didn't, uh, I, I'm, I, I, that, that might've been true. And, and they, maybe they were booked for the next week or the following month or something, um, because Johnny was going to be there. I, I think a lot of guests would rather not do the tonight show with a guest host, you know, mm -hmm. you'd rather, you'd rather do it with Johnny. I'm sure the ratings were better with Johnny than any guest host. So I, I but I, they never let me know that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Well, you've already mentioned the Hollywood squares, which we want to bring up, um, which you were a regular on and you ended up um, hosting and it's still considered one of the best game shows of all time. Um, and, and, and the fact that Paul Lynn's, jokes were written was that true of everyone yeah everyone wow. was given a everyone was given a funny answer they of course they can't give you the question and they can't give you the real answer because there's the laws against that you know yeah so but they they gave you a joke and you didn't know what the setup was <laughs> um, okay that's fascinating yeah so so th that that was the brilliance of paul lynn that he was able to step in and do a punchline and he never even knew what the setup was you know all he knew was that the, the the line was point and giggle and you didn't know that the set setup was that one what is one thing you should never do in the bedroom uh, <laughs> point and giggle you know yeah, yeah and so sure. it's a cute cute joke but he didn't know what the setup was but you know uh, usually when i was guesting on the on hollywood squares with uh, Peter Marshall, of course, Peter Marshall was the award-winning host. By the way, Peter Marshall's like 96 now and doing great. Mm. Um, he was the first host, I was the second host. And then of course, Tom Bergeron was the third host with Whoopi Goldberg in the center square. My, my center square was Joan Rivers and uh, who was great. And uh, what I loved about squares, oh, oh, so my agent came to me and he said, she, he said, uh, I've got that, that series that you've always wanted. Finally, I've got that series. I said, what is it? He said, well, we have an offer. I, I, I said, is it the $6 million man? Am, am I going to be like an action, action hero? <laughs> and, and they said, no, it's a game show. And I honestly, I turned it down at first. And I went, I went to a friend of mine a lawyer named Lane Dicker and I said I'm I I don't I want to I want to act I want to act I want to sing I want he said are you crazy this is Hollywood this is a huge show you got to do this so I took the show and uh I loved meeting all the famous people and hearing about all their projects Hollywood Squares like 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 Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune or all these daytime shows uh, are done, you do the whole week in one day. So you have dinner between Wednesday and Thursday while they change the audience because you wear out the audience on the first three shows. So at this dinner between Wednesday and Thursday, you, you, uh, it's a buffet 
and you and you get to meet all these famous people and and spend that dinner with them and it was just a great way to meet a lot of people in the business so i, I love that and uh I, I love hosting squares it was great you had just mentioned Paul Lynn, and I was like everyone else at the time. I was such a huge fan. I loved all the the jokes and everything. He was so funny to me. The last couple of years, I read so many negative things. How dark he was in such a bit. How did you find him to be like? Well, because I, things I read are not nice. So. Yeah, yeah. He. I don't think he liked me uh, or Karen Valentine. I think he thought that we were both just too too clean, too goody goody, too square. Um, yeah, I don't think Paul Lynn liked himself, uh, and, and I got the feeling that he didn't like me, and, and it was just, mm -hmm. just negative and gave me dirty looks, and I don't know, mm. uh, I think uh, he just wasn't happy. I think he was not a happy man, and, and I think that's true of a lot of people who are funny. Um, they're not the happy people um uh, i don't know why that goes hand in hand so not all the time not all the time but sometimes um, i think you're right i think i've read a lot of the same type of things that a lot of the, the best comedians have all these dark sides yeah uh, yeah i think i mean humor can be darkly funny you, know, you, you got to look at the dark side of thing if you just if everything is just rosy, then maybe it's not funny, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, no Norm Crosby. Norm, I worked a lot with Norm Crosby, and he was seemed to be a very happy guy. But I looked, I worked a lot with uh, Jerry Van Dyke, Dick Van Dyke's brother. Mm -hmm. Very funny in his act, and I'm not sure he was that happy a person. He, he was drinking a lot. Um, uh, but yeah, I, 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 it takes all kinds, but hmm. somehow uh, that uh, depression and humor tend to go together. I think. Yeah. Well, you mentioned just you mentioned drinking. We had uh, Anson Williams on, and he said that Hollywood Squares, like the Thursday and Friday shows, were the ones to look out for because, like, what have you yes. just said? Because everyone right. started they taped the weeks and everyone's drinking at lunch. So did you find that to be the case the same way? <laughs> that yeah. Yeah, everybody usually has a glass of wine and, and a beer or two. And yeah, so always watch the Thursday and Friday shows. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, nobody's, nobody's drunk, but they're, they're certainly a, a little more uh, easygoing. <laughs> well, when you hosted, were there any celebrities who were like less than stellar, kind of duds with their answers or not what you expected when, when they appeared? Yeah, uh, you uh, a, a lot of some celebrities uh, never deal with playing themselves, and so they're they're actors on series, so they've never worked on. Well, when I'm when I'm me, what role is who who am I? Uh -huh. I've 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 worked a lot on that, trying to figure out who John Davidson is, so that you know I'm not just a character. In, in a Broadway show or in a, a sitcom or something, I'm, I'm me. And so I, I've spent a lot of time getting comfortable in my own skin. And a lot of, uh, uh, some actors are not. So those actors uh, don't do the jokes well and, and, and are not comfortable being themselves. So be like, of course, on the shows like that, you always wanted to get Betty White. You know, you, if you could get Betty White on it. And we had Alf on my show, Alf, the guy who did Alf, the puppet, the puppet mm. Alf, very clever guy. And we had a lot of right. Jim J. Bullock was outrageously oh, funny. And uh, there's just a lot of very talented people. But but the classic, I mean, going back to Peter Marshall's Hollywood Squares with Wal uh, Wally Cox and mm -hmm. oh, uh, Charlie Weaver and Rosemary and of course, Paul Lynn and uh, um george gobel oh my goodness these are just Great. class classic <laughs> classic clowns yeah mm. wanted to ask about some of your memories of, of that's incredible which you did with kathy lee crosby and fran tarkenton uh 
that that was probably my biggest show. I, I, it was five years on uh, ABC. It was it was like a Ripley's Believe It or Not, all, you know, showing people going the extra mile or go, going going the distance mentally and physically and different uh, just oddities of life. It's just a fascinating show. Very young following. So a, a lot of kids who were like 12 to 15 are now, oh, early 40s. And so th that audience remembers me as that. But those people don't know that I sing. Um, some people who come to see me still don't know that I sing. No, 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 no. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I, I, in Hollywood Squares, and that's incredible, I didn't sing at all. So it's a surprise when I start singing, you know, on, on other shows. Um, because they missed the variety show years of my career, which were in the 70s, really 70s and early 80s. Um, that's incredible. I was very proud of it and, and loved working with Fran Tarkington. He's also a preacher's son. So mm -hmm. we, when preacher's son get together, they try to say as many four letter words as they can. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it tried just to be as nasty and dirty and just to show that we're not goody goody. You know? So we would always be telling each other just the foulest, dirty jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and Kathy Lee was great and so, so lovely and she she was great too so uh, but uh, I was not pleased I had some arguments with the not arguments but I would say why are we doing these stories about ghosts and about ESP and about things and at the end we'd say what do you think you know and it, it, it you know there are no ghosts that come on I mean there there's there's no such a ghost is human imagination and i i wish that we had said that and 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 not leave it open for people to be fooled by people who are selling ghost stories and stuff so yeah but it was a great show <laughs> was there anything presented to you that you just said no no we just we can't do that on tv well you got to remember that fran and kathy lee and i had nothing to do with producing the show we were simply mm -hmm dressing we came in on show day and the staff and uh uh woody uh, uh oh my goodness i've forgotten the producer's name uh Artie forrest was the director for a while and uh um uh, uh, woody is what we uh, it was the producer they, they would decide on what stories were good and and uh we were we were just dressing. We we did we <laughs> we we made no decisions about the show at all. Mm. I, I do need to ask about one show that you were on, which I loved. It was a huge pop culture show for my generation. Can't miss viewing in my house. You were on several Battle of the Network stars and, and did well in the events. I even I watched some this past week and the ones that you were on. You did great in the swimming and the running. So we had we had on uh, and you actually you captained the very last one and won actually. So that was the very last Battle of the Network stars. Yeah. We had Hal Linden on. He said that everyone took it lightly until the competition started. So what are your <laughs> memories of that show? And and do you find that to be the case as well? Yeah, I I I I, pull, I pulled my uh, thigh muscle running because I uh, in a mile relay thing because I just I, I ran full out without warming up and I mm. wasn't ready for it and by that time I was oh early forties I guess but uh, actually I, that's where I met Tom Selleck. Tom Selleck was uh, this young buck, you know, looking great, and he he was did the Hawaiian show the Man, Hawaii Five O. Magnum, Magnum. Oh, Magnum PI, Magnum yeah. PI, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hawaii Five-O was Jack Lord, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. yeah, Magnum PI. And uh, great looking guy. Uh, he was so cool. I wanted to be like Tom Selleck. <laughs> I thought, this is a cool guy. Uh, he's a ladies' man. He's a man's man. He's, he's, just, a, he's just a good guy. So uh, that was fun meeting him. And, and uh, it was fun meeting celebrities in a different situation, you know, and, and uh, running around and trying to win. Uh, I don't know. It was a fun day. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were in um, Edward Scissorhands. 
and mm. with of course someone who's in the news now johnny depp and and directed by tim burton and that's one of, one of my favorite movies i think it's just an incredibly beautiful film um what was it like to work uh with both of them well the, the director i'm trying to think of the directors the great director's name tim burton tim burton oh tim burton yeah yeah so i so i only worked on that film for one day oh wow uh, I just played a talk show host in it, in, which is yeah, a talk show host and 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 worked with Diane Weist, who was just wonderful, mm. and and met Johnny Depp, met Johnny Depp in makeup, and and uh, he was trying to learn his lines and was busy, and uh, but I didn't, I, so I don't didn't really get to know him well. But Tim Burton spent about twenty minutes describing what Edward Scissor's Hands was all about, and was, I mean his his mouth couldn't keep up with his brain he was just he just he's just a passionate uh man who's overflowing with imagination and uh mm. very impressed with him he, he literally couldn't speak fast enough to keep up with his brain uh just a brilliant guy but i was only there for one day so it was mm. I, I i it was it, it was great it's a wonderful film mm -hmm. but uh uh, I, I just bopped in, grabbed the money, and ran. <laughs> My so favorite else? kinds of jobs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you you were, you've starred with so many legendary performers through the years, like Lucille Ball, Bob Hope, Jack Benny, Jerry Lewis. Anyone really stand out to you that this person was great, or someone that you thought was intimidating, or not what you thought that they would be? I, I, I did I did two of the Lucille Ball shows. Uh, later when Lucy Arnaz, her daughter, uh, played her daughter on the show, right? She had, yes, I guess, yes. but, and I was the love interest. So Lucy and I did, had, had fun. We did a couple duets together. It was great. And I, but I never realized that Lucy was so hands-on with that show. Now, I'm not sure she was in the original I Love Lucy show, but here she, you know, she was a showgirl, I guess, just a pretty girl that got, in, got into comedy. But man, she, by the time she got to the latter part of her career, especially, she, she knew lighting, she knew wardrobe, she knew direction. Oh, she knew just pacing of the show, camera angles, um, sound, whether the sound was right. And just, she was just all over the show. And um, everyone on set knew that, that Lucy ran that show so I, I i saw a different side she wasn't just a a funny lady she was brilliant at at produce she, she produced and directed i, I swear uh, bob hope was very nice to me we did uh, did a couple of his specials and uh just a really sweet man and uh so funny because everything was on cue cards so you would look you'd be talking with him and you'd be looking off camera you couldn't look him in the eye because you're reading the cue card and and he wasn't looking at me he was looking over my shoulder at the cue card while we're doing jokes it was weird <laughs> but uh, really a sweet man um yeah it was a joy to work with some of those great but carol burnett carol burnett helped me so much in the early part of my career especially and and then she had me on her show a couple times and it was just a just so supportive and uh there's another case of a lady who's very shy mm. and, and uh, it's just so warm and, and she's figured out how to work with that. I think she was very shy as a kid, as I was. And, uh, and, and I think she would rather play, you know, a goofy lady like a, a washerwoman or a, or, a, or a, a proud grand dame than play Carol Burnett, you know? So she did several films, I think, where she, seem more like doing Carol Burnett and I, I think it, uh, she would rather play a character I think she would admit that and so that's why she did those the Q&A thing on her show you know right. her, her producer was Bob Banner who found me on Broadway and they said they developed that talk segment for Carol in order for her, her to have experience being herself hmm. because uh I don't think at, at, when she first did that, I don't think she trusted that she's a charming, charming, lovable, funny lady. But I think she felt better when she was when she was being goofy. And uh, 
So it was, it's interesting how everybody makes it through show business in different ways. Yeah, I, I have to say I share that uh, characteristic with you guys because I was always a very introverted, shy child. And the fact that I actually got into the business at nine years old and, and worked as much as I did fascinated me because I was very reserved. But if you hand me my lines, my scene, my character, whatever I needed to do, suddenly then I came out. And so that was my place to to be myself was actually when I wasn't being myself. So I, I, I get it. It's a very strange thing because uh, there are those precocious people who are born performers. They're out front and center and they got no problem with it. And I admire them tremendously because I do not have that in me. At all. <laughs> but moving on to just another fascinating thing about you, you created a game called Borderline USA. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Oh, thanks. For, I don't have a I don't have a copy of it here. Um, it's uh, it's a geography card game. We, uh, my wife and I, Rhonda, we homeschooled uh, our daughter from second grade through eighth grade, and got her ready for a very fine uh, private school in New Jersey. But uh, yeah, she was homeschooled for about six years, and we did lots of games to teach her stuff. Borderline USA teaches people. Uh, mm -hmm where the states are it's all about where the states are it's a little bit like uno the simple card game but instead of playing a card that matches a color or a number in borderline usa you're matching borders mm. so you can mm. play any you can play any state on top of the last the card played you can play any state that borders the previous card so if mm. somebody played texas you could play oklahoma on top of texas and there's four there's four water cards, Great Lakes, one card, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Gulf of Mexico. So any state that bordered those areas can be, you know, it's all about what borders what. And there's a wild card to get you out of trouble. But the most fun of it is you can bluff. You can bluff if you say, I'm playing Maine on Arizona. And if nobody challenges it, <laughs> you get away so it's, it's, fun. Gonna... it's fun it's fun for the whole family uh it's available on uh, john davidson.com it's called borderline usa wow oh, that's amazing it sounds great <laughs> i mean, want to get back to club sandwich before we let you go now when does the new season start uh new uh, on uh, uh friday june the 24th and we go through october 2nd it's about four months mm -hmm. And uh, then in the winter, I'm living on my boat in the Sea of Cortez near, <laughs> near La Paz, Mexico. That's where my son is and my granddaughters. Uh, but yeah, so this is our second season. And then we're presenting guest artists on Thursday nights. We've got a bunch of guest artists that, uh, um, that uh, you would know the names. I should have that list in front of me, but <laughs> a bunch of very funny people. A, a very good songwriters. Yeah. Okay. I, I wish I lived in New Hampshire. If I, I got to make it over there to see you, because <laughs> you're not yeah. coming to Florida to do to perform. So I got to get over there. Yeah. <laughs> so, but John, this has been so much. I want to. I want to ask you again. Do you have any social media that we should uh, post besides JohnDavidson.com? Uh, no, uh, that's social media is what. Um, there's a Twitter account, Instagram, but uh, on. Uh, I'm on Facebook a lot, and uh, uh, I love social media. It's 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 helped me spread the word about Club Sandwich, and um, and then I do a newsletter. I have a uh, thousands of people that get my newsletter, and and it's I love that. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, one last song I could sing you as, as we say hi. <laughs> I was hoping we were going to get yes, an exit song. Yeah, well, I want to say thank you to I. I want to say thank you to Jonathan. Pop culture, retro. I've been a pleasure being on the show. I hope they'll invite me back. Got lots more to tell. Such a great show. Ike and Jonathan, pop culture retro. I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's uh, fantastic. <laughs> you, you, you guys advise, Annie. You're just so supportive, and uh, thank you for letting me do it. <laughs>
Great so, talking with you guys. Good luck great. with the show and congratulations on all your success. Thank Thanks. you. Thank, Thank you much. You. It's been such a pleasure getting to talk to you. Huge fan always and continue to be. So thank Thanks, you. Sir. Talk to you soon. This has been Pop Culture Retro. I'm Jonathan Rosen with Ike Eisenman. And a very special thanks to John Davidson. Thanks for watching and please subscribe. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast.